Coming up next on this week computer hardware, an awesome $200 512GB SSD. Intel drops the speed bomb, plus monitors, motherboards, CPUs, and awesome cases from Computex and Google's spatially aware tablet. It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 270, recorded June 5th, 2014. Computex and two epic SSDs. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by iFixit. You can fix it, and iFixit makes it easy. With free step-by-step -step repair guides, high-quality replacement parts, and all the tools you'll need. For $10 off your purchase of $50 or more, go to ifixit.com slash twit and enter the code TWITCH at checkout. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch's weekly show that aims to bring you the most useful, most informative, most fun, most exciting, and this week, most Computex news available around the PC hardware world. We also love, well, look, we love computers. We love Macintosh. We love PC. We love tablets. We even send some love in the direction of the smartphone world. Pull Ryan up here. He's ready, man. He's been dealing with Computex news, flooding his lifestyle for the last week. Are you feeling the Computex lifestyle, man? Uh, you know what? I, I have to say, so Computex is an interesting beast because it takes place in a part of the world since in Taiwan and it's exactly 12 hours time difference from the East Coast time zone, which I am in. So uh, usually I am in Computex. This is actually uh, my third year in a row not attending Computex. And I got I to gotta say, it, it feels pretty good. Um, Mike, <laughs> I, 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 pause. I'm going to say after three years of not attempting, no, 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 not, not pause the video. Pause, Ryan. After three years of not attending Computex in a row, I'm going to say you no longer usually go to Computex. <laughs> well, I went I went 11 years in a row. Okay. So uh, I think that offsets it. But uh, I, what I was going to say is, like, essentially, it, it, it screws up your time zone one, one way or the other. When I was doing Twitch, when I was in Taiwan, I had to get up at, like, 8 in the morning and make sure I was ready to talk about stuff because it was 9 a.m. Uh, when I was recording that there. Now, uh, here, what we did all week was we essentially stayed up till 2, 3, 4 in the morning to make sure we had all of the news as it was coming in, right? So, right. Uh, it still screwed up sleep schedules, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Everything's still backwards. Well, we've got some exciting product reviews and a preview of what's coming up on PC Per that is not to be believed. Um, and I got to say, Pika Zen 2310 Soho NAS server review coming. We're going to talk about budget storage with premium features, but we are going to have a festival of Computex announcements. It's kind of like the old PC... Uh, well, basically, it's CES, but it's all computer components in the place where they build a lot of computers. Um, Asus PA30... 32.8Q, a 60 hertz professional 4K panel, the Asus PG278Q, G-Sync, 144 hertz at 1440p, and the Acer XB280HK, 28 inch 4K with G-Sync. Is 28 inches too small for a 4K panel? I mean, it's, it's like retina rates, although at it's, some point retina at 28K seems kind of crazy pants. Well, when you never, when you take a look at what uh, Apple did when they went to the retina displays, they didn't make all the icons very tiny. And that is kind of, um, it's maybe I would say not intuitive to a lot of people that aren't really into the science behind it, right? Uh, when you do a 28 inch 4K monitor and you keep it at a 100% scaling rate in Windows, for example, uh, icons and text become very small. <laughs> and it can become hard to read unless you're very, very close to that display. So uh, what you're going to do instead, more than likely, unless you have uh, Eagle Vision, is you will uh, you know, increase scaling to 125% or 150%. And when you do that, 28 inches is perfect for 4K. Now, the, the complication, as we went over before, is like eh, some applications don't respond to that scaling very well. Uh, you have to hack around it like Chrome. But like Internet Explorer looks awesome at 150% scaling at 4K at 28 inches. Now, I think, um, you know, you could probably go up to as high as like 37-inch monitors. You know, I, that's what I kind of want to see is like good quality panels, a little bit larger, 
uh, taking up the space of uh, two displays that you would normally have anyway at 4K, where you can keep 100% scaling. And now you're getting real estate improvements in addition to, you know, uh, uh, clarity improvements. But these these monitors are kind of interesting. Like that first one, the PA 328Q. It's like kind of it's from ASUS. It's it's different than the than the PB 287Q that we looked at earlier. This one's kind of like professional series, which I'm hoping means it's going to have like an IGZO or IPS or PLS panel type instead of a TN, but it also right. adds HDMI 2.0 support, which is, uh, I think it's the first display I've actually, you know, heard of first time, you know, where, yes, it's going to have HDMI 2.0, but keep in mind, there are no graphics cards right now that actually output at HDMI 2.0, which would allow you to do 4K 60 hertz <laughs> over an HDMI cable. So um, I'm hoping the professional just means that it's, a better quality image or better quality screen than what we had with it. You're going to pay more. You know, the, that, that PB series is $650. It's going to be available um, between now and the next Twitch show that we do. Apparently, it'll be available on June 10th. So that's pretty good. And then, hey, Asus has a G-Sync monitor. They announced it at CES, and it's actually going to be available in July. So there's, there's that. Um, quite a long delay, I would say, uh, for that. It's going to be seven hundred ninety nine dollars, but it is an uh, it is I believe it's an IPS twenty five by fourteen. No, it's just TN twenty five by fourteen, hundred and forty four hertz G Sync monitor. So I think for gamers that uh, aren't infatuated with the idea of four K, don't want to invest in the graphics horsepower required to run at four K, uh, a twenty five by fourteen G Sync panel is going to be pretty compelling, actually. Yeah. Uh, if it works as advertised, right? If it still works, it's been so long <laughs> since I've actually used the G-Sync monitor. Um, I, I, you know, I, we need to kind of retest and reevaluate all that stuff. Uh, and actually, that last one you mentioned, the Acer 4K with G-Sync, I think that's uh -huh. going to be a little bit further out in terms of release time frames. Uh, okay. But I, I think we talked about it real briefly a week or two, maybe two weeks ago. Like, the 4K resolution is perfect for G-Sync because that optimal zone for where G-Sync and the variable refresh makes the most sense is uh, in that 40 to 60 frames per second range, right? Which is, right. you know, when you're running at 4K, your graphics hardware is going to be down that low. You know, it's going to be struggling to keep up that frame rate. So it, it, it would make sense there. And, and it's, it's just, it's cool to see displays um, iterating and changing and new technologies and new resolutions. We were stuck on 1080p for so long. And it feels mm -hmm. like in the last year, basically we hit 25 by 14, 27 inch low cost monitors. And we're already starting to get into the 4k low cost monitors, which is just, it's awesome to see. Yes. It'll be more often awesome, awesome, awesome when we can afford GPUs and afford 4k monitors, which is actually closing in on yep. as fast, I think. Um, AMD demonstration, or you want to go to Corsair next? As we the go the AMD demonstration, context. I think the AMD one's important. Um, if you remember, so at CES, AMD came out with this little demo they called FreeSync. And right. it was like, hey, we can do what G-Sync does, but it's going to be free because it's going to be part of the DisplayPort standard. And uh, they demoed it on a laptop because they had to demo it on a laptop. The technology... Uh, to vary the refresh rate of a laptop panel was already there. It had been used for power savings reasons, not for performance and experience reasons. Uh, but if you could refresh the panel fewer times, you could save battery life, that kind of thing. Uh, in May, the Visa board uh, adopted something called Adaptive Sync into the DisplayPort 1.2a standard, which integrates similar features to what G-Sync is. Now, to be fair... I don't know exactly how this is going to perform. If it's exactly what G-Sync does, if it's similar to what right. G-Sync is, will it go up to 144 hertz? Will it only go up to 60? You know, something we'll have to see. But uh, AMD was demoing the first prototype monitor, and uh, a couple of interesting news bits came out with it. One was that this monitor was a pre-existing monitor that had been flashed to support DisplayPort 1.2a and FreeSync or adaptive mm -hmm. sync, whatever you want to call it, right? So the idea that there are monitors out there with scalers in them that could be upgraded to support adaptive sync is pretty interesting. Will any monitor vendor actually offer that upgrade or will they just 
not and choose instead to, uh, you know, force people to buy new displays. It's not very often that a monitor company gets a reason to really push the upgrade cycle on a vendor or on a consumer right. rather. Uh, and then the second part is that AMD had to admit that, you know, only the 290, the 290X, the 260 and the 260X in our current graphics card lineup will support adaptive sync. So mm. that's surprising to me, actually, um, that only those GPUs have the display controller in there that will support the variable refresh stuff in, uh, in, in adaptive sync, right? So if you have a 280X or a 270X or an HD 7000 series card, they will not be able to support adaptive sync monitors when they come out probably by the end of the year. So that was the bad news to kind of go along with the good news from the demonstration. <laughs> we like good news. Yep. Bad news, not so much. But, you know, I think it also means it's maybe something they have to do in the chips going forward. Is it a power issue or something in the chip set that they have to include? <laughs> I, I think it has something to do issue. it's display controller and its ability right. to send or not send certain signals at certain times. And it must be, I mean, if it were, if they could update their graphics cards or their driver to do it, I'm sure they would. Cause it's, it's a pretty big knock for them to admit yeah. that so much, so much of their, uh, you know, graphics portfolio does not support this technology that they're heavily pushing. Right. You know, it's a counter right. to NVIDIA G-Sync tech. Uh, so it must be dead set. It, you know, there's no, there's no potential workaround for it. So uh, I don't really know why it is, but it has something to do with the display right. controller on, on the, on the GPU itself. Said an amusing moment in the chat room uh, where somebody pointed out that HDMI 2.0 is not a spec. And then someone posted the press release from the HDMI consortium about the HDMI 2.0 spec. Um, there's some engineering humor going on in there that I'm not going to touch, but I just <laughs> wanted to point that out. Uh, Corsair never met a trade show where it couldn't drop a new case. Kind of text 2014, not an exception. The Carbide Air 240, the Carbide 780T, and the Graphite 380T enclosures because apparently Corsair didn't have enough cases. And I got to say, some of these are, I mean, Corsair always has some really cool stuff, but the Air 240 looks really nice. It's a smaller version of the 540. Um, the idea that they have all of the airflow in a very, very small package, that's what you're looking at right there, is the 240 micro ATX and mini ATX motherboards. Comes with three of Corsair's AF120 fans to support 240 millimeter radiators and long graphics cards. So you can have the fat gaming package in a small package, which sounds really weird when I say it out loud like that. And I apologize. Sebastian, yep. who wrote this up for PCPro.com. That beast you're looking at right now is the Graphite 780T in black, which obviously has LEDs or LEDs, as we call them here in the United States, inside the case on the fans. Um, basically a little more like the 600T has the rounded action going on there. And if you scroll down in a glorious blaze of clinical white, uh, the uh, 780T <laughs> in white. Um, so I'm just saying... You know, big airflow. The coolest one, I think the Graphite 380T may be the most interesting one. Uh, um, where it's, it's so cute. mini ITX. Yeah, it looks like, yeah, I mean, it looks like that's not, keep going down. Keep going down, Burke. Scroll. Oh, there, there it, is. it is. Look at it. Well, it looks it's like, like it, an it looks ice like cube. a heat sink. <laughs> it looks like a, yeah, I was going to say, it looks like an igloo cooler and a heat sink had a love child. Um, <laughs> oh, you let know, Lane actually look. And I should apologize because I'm coming up with the same jokes that Sebastian did in writing this up. Um, Full-length graphics cards, 240 millimeter radiators, and up to four three and a half inch or two and a half inch hard drives, uh, latched side panels, 120 millimeter, 140 millimeter AF series fans, three feet span controller, 129.99. And I and I gotta say, having seen a lot of 100 150 dollar cases, I wouldn't touch that one's really really tempting. Um, uh, even if it does have LEDs in the fan, which I like to tease. Uh, and it's just cool. It's interesting. Yep. Um, Copy 2014, Corsair announces the Hydro Series HG10 GPU liquid cooling bracket. Um, so Corsair gets into GPU liquid cooling. Uh, this was also written up by Sebastian. And uh, it's a self-contained liquid CPU cooler with a compatible graphics card. That's where I started getting confused when I started realizing this. So it's essentially, is it an aftermark? So it's an aftermarket self-contained liquid cooler, but it's really a fan on a bracket with liquid cooling. So or, or are we the, plugging the new, liquid cooling into the bracket? Kind of. So the, the new thing is just the bracket. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
it, when you look at the at that first picture where you see the card and you've got this bracket uh -huh. with the fan on it, that is the right. device that is thirty nine ninety nine, and this okay. allows you to attach any of the other pre existing Corsair water coolers. Got it. Okay. Okay. And what's kind of interesting about this, and I'm not a hundred percent sure how this works yet, but if you look at um, this is so this only supports the 290 and the 290X. If you look at that red okay. fan on there, it might look familiar. And it should look <laughs> familiar because it is the fan from the cooler of your 290 or 290X video card. Dun, dun, right. Dun. So when you when you buy this, you're only getting the bracket. The fan doesn't even come with it, as far as I can tell. Right. Instead, you take the fan <laughs> off of your heat sink and put it on the bracket. And then but you Ryan run that. Why do I need yes. a fan in addition to the superior heat transfer available with the water cooling that I'm going to bolt onto this after I spend $39 uh, you need, for it? You need that because of the RAM chips and power delivery uh, parts on there, essentially, right? So uh, the, the, the water cooler is cooling the GPU only, right? There's no fan to blow air over the rest of the right. PCB. So that's what that's responsible for. The part that okay. I, I'm not quite sure I understand is, like... The reason you want an aftermarket cooler is because the 290 and the 290X coolers were really loud and bad and annoying. Right. So maybe the fan by itself isn't loud and annoying. It was when it was being blown over the uh, the channels themselves, right, that it created the annoying noise. Or if, so maybe this will be fine. You spin the fan slower because the, yep. the the thermals coming off of the parts it's now over are considerably lower than the actual chip itself. Um, yeah, man, I don't know. It's, how about we wait? We'll see. Yeah. Get it in for testing and see what happens. Uh, something we saw at CVS that everybody loved, Corsair's Cherry MX RGB keyboards. Um, Scott wrote this up for PC Per. Um, so, you know, early teases in December, we got to touch them and look at them and drool over them at CES in January. So they're essentially red, green, and blue LEDs um, inside of the keys that can glow up to 16 million colors. Each key can glow its own color. Uh, each key has independent brightness. There's essentially this crazy interface in the computer or software interface you tweak settings on. Um, and you know, our understanding was that they have a year of exclusivity, which we assume started in January. So we're now at the halfway point. So hopefully, I mean, are these going to be out in time for the holiday shopping season? Yes, late August. Sorry. Yep. Um, and boy, are they pricey. The K70 RGB red is $170. The RGB blue is $170. The RGB brown is $70. These are the switch descriptions. And the K95 RGB red uh, will be available for $190. Uh, first of those, uh, the uh, K70 RGB red shows up in July. The rest show up in late August. Um, man. Man, man, man. You know what? It's... It seems kind of like a gimmick, um, right. but there are some cool ideas they demonstrated. You know, you can do the gimmicky things like as you type, the like the the letters illuminate as you type, and they kind of slowly fade away, and it creates a pretty cool effect. Um, but even if you're like if you're a gamer, right, and you are playing an MMO that has sections of keys for certain things, you may say, you know, I want all of my keys that do healing spells to illuminate in green. All of my keys that are assigned to attack spells will illuminate in red. Um, you know, the, the, the motion keys will do yellow or, or something like that, right? So, and you can, you know, set that up however you want. And each key can be individually colored, right? So you have that capability. So I think it has some interesting functional parts to it besides just looking badass while you are typing away. If somebody's looking over your shoulder, I guess. It probably doesn't happen that often. Um, but... You know, that, those are expensive keyboards. They're not super wildly outside the realm of other, you know, high-end cherry keyboards. They're probably 40 bucks more than some of the other ones we've seen, uh, especially ones that have that many macro keys and uh, functionality there. So, uh, and also, you don't have the issue that you had with the first generation of Corsair keyboards, which we mostly liked, was that some keys were cherry and some keys were switch or uh, like scissor switch. So you don't have that anymore, right? If they're all illuminated, you can you can kind of assume that they're all going to be cherry, which is, a, which is an advantage too. Um, but I, I'm eager to get one of these and, and play around with it in a dark room because why not? Right. Well, yeah, no, it's it's cool. It's exciting. And it's, it's just, and it's not like, you know, really good cherry switch keyboards are that inexpensive. Um, just be interesting to see what the price is next year.
Somebody's yeah. apparently hitting a gong outside. I don't know if you guys can hear that, but if some sort of Godzilla yeah. foot comes through the ceiling, um, I probably <laughs> just missed my warning on that one. I just wanted to share that with you guys. Um, uh, Corsair, let's see. We're, okay, so we got the Corsair enclosures. There it is. Uh, the Corsair Flash Voyager GTX USB, which is a big name for what is essentially uh, SSD over USB 3.0. Uh, Scott wrote this up for PC Per. Um, you know, it's it's a, well, it's, it's a basically, so it looks like a USB thumb drive, but it includes trim support, smart monitoring, interfaces with USB, attached SCSI, uh, comes in two SSD size capacities, 128 gigabytes for 120 bucks and 256 gigabytes for 200 bucks, uh, rated at 450 megabytes per second read and 350 megabytes per second write. Um, it's kind of funny because essentially what, 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 what Scott points out is these are basically priced against the 840 Pro price-wise. Um, Five-year warranty on these in case you're worried about thumb drives dying. Uh, and, quote, while the 840 Pro has higher read bandwidth, the write speeds are fairly comparable. Uh, IOPS and write durability not known yet for the new Corsair drives. Um, man, that could be really interesting. It's, it's an interesting thing. I don't for USB 3.0. I, I question the need for a 256 gig thumb drive, you know, in reality, even if it is super fast. Alan suggested last night that you may, uh, you know, you can basically run an operating system off of it, right? You have to do a little bit of right. trickery to like get Windows to install to a USB drive. But once it's there, if you change the system to boot off USB, it will just boot into the operating system, right? Mm -hmm. um, you could do it where you, if you're an IT guy, right, and you want to have images for 15 different machines that you have, uh, you know, for your office you know you have those and you can just walk up to each computer plug it in run it and you don't have to worry about you know which disc you're carrying or or you know doing things like that there are right. some use cases for it but especially for 200 bucks a 200 dollars usb thumb drive that you might accidentally wash or lose <laughs> it's it's tough for me well it might be a little big to be a sort of in your pocket kind of thumb drive, but we will find out soon enough. <laughs> we should take a moment in, in between our spates of Computex madness to give our thanks to ifixit.com slash twit. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I've been using iFixit for years. If you're not familiar with iFixit, which I find difficult to believe, um, iFixit, it's it's the free online repair manual for everything. They have more than 10,000 guides for everything from electronics, like your smartphone, your tablet, your game console, to your home appliances, clothing, and even your bike. My introduction to iFixit was fixing uh, MacBook notebooks and then later on smartphones. If you take a look, uh, they have some great instructions. For example, if you wanted to uh, fix the screen on your iPhone 5S, you drop your phone, the screen shatters, you go in and they have step-by-step -step guides that show you every individual uh, thing you need to do to replace a broken part inside of your smartphone. Uh, they have a staggering number of these guides. The, the, the really most incredibly detailed ones are centering on, the, on Apple's products, but they have, like I mentioned before, more than 10,000 repair guides up on the site now. Um, it's amazing. So, you know, they also sell along with repair parts. And of course, they give you the repair guides for free. Um, they do some really, really nice tools to make it easier for you to have the odd little things you need to actually repair the difficult aspects of your electronics. Case in point, something we use almost every day on Texel, the ProTex screwdriver set. Uh, 15 screwdrivers specifically chosen uh, by the iFixit Teardown team. Um, they believe that these screwdrivers can handle more than 90% of electronics repairs. A matter of fact, I was using the number one Phillips head screwdriver out of this kit earlier today to repair a projector, uh, or actually to put a new lamp in a projector, and I was using the pentalobe screwdrivers to uh, relocate the back on my phone after I dropped it one too many times this week. Um, they're designed for heavy use. They are actually really, really tightly engineered. They're pretty precise. They have a black oxide tip, which makes it easier to hold on to the screw. That's the nice little bit down there at the bottom. Fixed blade, swivel top design for added precision, so you're not wondering where you dropped that tip out of your 74-bit collection. And it comes yep. in a nice little custom tool roll, so you have a nice portable toolkit, whether you're an amateur or a professional fixer. Lifetime warranty, $60, actually $59.95 from iFixit.com. And they also have something that I've been using a lot lately, the Magnetic Project Mat. As iFixit says, repair can be tough. This mat makes it easier. 
I had to replace four motors on a drone and then I had to replace them again and they had to replace them again because the wiring for the motors did not actually work with the electronic speed controllers on the drones. Um, what's really cool about the magnetic project map, it, is, it, it looks like whiteboard material except it's magnetic so you could plop your screws down in order. Now I'm the guy who's been using blue tape to hold his parts down on a sheet of cardboard uh, for years and this is really nice. Uh, if, if the screws inside your thing are magnetic, they will stick to this, they will stay in place. We had it upside down. Okay, I didn't shake it because it's my boss's drone I was fixing and I didn't want to ruin it uh, by losing a bunch of tiny, tiny screws. But it does a really good job. It's safe for hard drive. It's safe for electronics. Uh, it's got a dry erase surface so you can use a dry erase marker to write the name of each little section on there. And I like the idea that somebody's working hard to make sure you never lose a screw again. That's 1995 from ifixit.com. People with ifixit.com, you can fix it yourself. Visit ifixit.com slash twit for more than 10,000 free step by step guides and iFixit also sells every part and tool you need. If you enter in the code TWITCH, that's T-W-I-C-H at checkout, you'll save $10 off any purchase of $50 or more. That's iFixit.com slash TWIT and we want to thank iFixit for their support of this week in computer hardware. I've been a customer of theirs for years. The tools are solid. Uh, I like tools that don't fall apart, especially if they come at a decent price. So yeah, we use them all the time here as well. We should talk about Asus. Sure. And, uh, Why not? Motherboard names. As motherboard <laughs> manufacturers continue to attempt to come up with the most militaristic and majestic name of a motherboard yet, Asus drops the ROG Crossblade Ranger motherboard, which has a vision of a sort of special forces dude wielding a crossbow and looks like this in real life. What did Maury have to say about the Crossblade Ranger? Ranger, Ranger. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree that the, the naming scheme is a little, maybe a little bit off base. Um, the idea behind it is, is interesting, right? So the ROG brand, Republic of Gamers brand, is, is their mm -hmm. high-end motherboard brand. They also do it for video cards and for laptops and stuff like that as well. And it's been quite a while since they had a enthusiast-targeted AMD motherboard um right the amd motherboards haven't really or amd processors rather haven't really been focused on the super high end and so you know a company like asus may not spend the development time and cost to develop that or to to build that particular board i think they're kind of taking a chance here with the crossblade ranger which is an fm2 plus motherboard which means it's supporting apus right so the kaveri apu in particular um it will have you know, some of the same features that you'll see on the Z97 ROG motherboards, like mm -hmm. us, the Supreme FX audio subsystem, the Radar 2 in-game right. audio enhancement. You've got uh, Intel-based internet, Intel-based gigabit Ethernet controller with uh, game-first technology on that for network optimization. You've got the Keybot uh, uh, macro technology, which is a little chip that will intercept a USB port. So it'll actually mm -hmm. hardware, can, you can actually make settings that will change usb input function at the hardware level right if you so if wow. your system is off for example you can hit shift delete and it will turn on the system and boot into the bios right okay cool you can do cool little things like that um you know i i think it would be really interesting to see kind of what the response is to this motherboard because i just don't know if what what the price if the we don't know the price of this yet no we don't know the right. price of this yet and kaveri is a low cost part Right. Is it a right. it is a mainstream processor and you can't charge two hundred dollars for a motherboard if the processor is ninety bucks, right? <laughs> You're not gonna get a whole lot of takers on that deal. So I'll be curious to see what the pricing is uh, and what other features they may or may not have on it, right? And just right. kind of looking at it now. I think the audio is gonna be the big change. Um, you're not doing a whole bunch of overclocking, so you don't need super robust power delivery on a Kaveri mm -hmm. board. I, I, th I think it's interesting, um, but I'm, I'm not 100% confident in its success as a platform. Right. It was interesting. We did a review of a, of a Puget Systems box that, that, that they sent to us along with an Asus, uh, uh, an Asus 4K monitor. And uh, it was interesting to watch, uh, especially on YouTube, the reaction to the idea of having like a $6,000 system with a AMD processor inside. And uh, the funny argument was going on. So it was like, who would do this with an AMD processor? And like three lines above them, somebody had posted, I have this same system, but I put it together for like $4,000. And uh, 
it was an interesting sort of parallel series of arguments on AMD versus Intel and DIY versus, you know, boutique manufacturing. Um, but yeah, they're going to have to keep that motherboard cheap if people are going to put $65 parts on it. Um, man, the uh, world's fastest video card. This, speaking of sort of militaristic designs, this looks like a freaking Magpul uh, AR-15. Uh, <laughs> this looks like I'm going to slot it into a 40-watt laser rifle, maybe not an AR-15. Um, the Ares 3 with a full EK water block. Uh Ultra powerful limited edition graphics cards, uh, set to be the world's fastest video card. Sebastian wrote this up for PC Per. This is, uh, oh, look at that. If you look at the corner there in the silver button, you see 001 of 500, the mm -hmm. most exclusive graphics card in the history <laughs> of graphics cards. This dual GPU powerhouse is driven by two hand selected Radeon Hawaii XT GPUs. That's R9 290X cores, people, coupled to eight gigabytes of supple, fast GDDR5 memory, overclockable according to Asus, and will likely arrive factory overclocked. It's basically, so they're saying it's going to be faster than an R9 295X2. Uh, they have that monster custom designed EK water block. Um, so uh, you won't have to supply your own cooling top. Quote, 25% cooler performance than a reference R9 295X design, claims Asus. Uh, but to achieve this, Asus, quote, highly, unquote, recommends a high flow rate loop with at least 120 by 3 radiator to extract maximum performance from the card. <laughs> they will provide a list of recommended water cooling systems at launch. So... Only 500 Aries 3 cards will be made. They are individually numbered. No pricing has been announced. And I'm quoting, um, I'm directly quoting uh, Sebastian here, and I want to attribute that because they're his words. But Asus says to expect it to be more than a 295X2, that's $1,500 to you, but less than a Titan Z, which sells for $3,000. Uh, Q3 2014, just in time for holiday shopping for the gamer that has everything. And by the way, I want to point out that that's somewhere between 1500 and 3000 I'll pull a number out. Let's call it 2000 And you're going to have to buy <laughs> a big old monster radiator uh, uh, and water cooling to assemble that puppy up. So do your you already favor. have it. Be really careful when you put the water in that system and make sure the tubes are properly connected before you, uh, before you fire that up. Cause that would be an expensive, that would just be an expensive oops. If you zapped that card, um, <laughs> Asus Republic of Gamers announces GX 500 ultra thin 15.6 inch 4k gaming notebook. Just because I thought 28 inch 4k monitors might be a bit much. Asus has decided to create a 4k 15.6 inch gaming laptop. They did that just to blow my mind. Um, Asus Visual Master Technology proclaimed 100% NTSC wide color gamut, which is a world first on a notebook. According to Asus, um, M.2 SSD running on a full PCI Express X4 connection, dual fan cooling system. No idea what the pricing is going to be, uh, but I bet it is going to be epic. Um, Core i7 processor, NVIDIA GeForce GTX 860M graphics. Can an 860M run a 4K monitor at anything other than 1080p resolutions? No. <laughs> I mean, no, I don't want to... I don't want to poke I mean, a the, hole in this like, balloon. But. The idea of having a 4K monitor on a 15-inch screen obviously it necessitates the scaling, right? And you get into that whole how many DPI are you, and it could make, you know, 2D games or 2D, you know, Windows environments look really awesome. Uh, but you're not right. going to be able to game at 3840 by 2160, right? You, you're going to game at 1080p, and then it's going right. to be upscaled to 3840 by 2160. And then now you have to start looking at what is the <laughs> scaler of uh, that panel, actually like or is the gpu right. handling the scaling right how much you know how much different does it look on a native 1080p screen versus this kind of upscale 3 uh 3840 by 2160 uh and it's it's not an easy answer right um right. but you know if you can claim the the 4k <sighs> notebook the 4k laptop for okay. under five pounds under just about three quarters of an inch thick you know it's it, it'll probably be a powerful machine but I think the the the, the UHD screen is kind right. of a misstep. It's not a maybe gimmick. not a misstep, but it's just yeah, it's like a gimmick. It's, it's just something. Gimmick. It's like yeah, we can do it. 
So we did that. <laughs> New unlocked 4th gen Intel Core processors, outstanding levels of performance and flexibility. You gotta love it when you get weird little sort of mythical zombie death devil characters on your slides from Intel. Um, <laughs> it doesn't happen very often. Doesn't, it's, you know. The new unlocked 4th fourth, fourth gen Intel Core processors deliver four cores of up to four gigahertz base frequency, providing blazing fast computing performance for the most demanding users. Um, four cores, eight threads to, quote, rock the latest games and rip through multimedia creation. I'm quoting Intel Ugh. here. Robust yeah, overclocking capabilities. These are fully unlocked processor cores with independent-based clock tuning. Um, so the idea is that uh, you're going to be able to tune up the processor without wiping out all the rest of your system. So that's cool, though. It's a it's a four gigahertz base clock, maximum turbo clock rate of four point four gigahertz. And I should probably stop talking because you wrote the article, and I guarantee you know more about this processor than I do. Are you excited, or is this just hyperbole with goofy graphics? So it's a little bit of both, right? Um, mm -hmm. The the fact that they're calling uh, so the they what they took what they did was they took the Haswell processor. It's the exact same core. It's the exact same. Uh, architecture and everything like that. Uh, you remember people were, were like complaining about the thermal interface right. with uh, Ivy Bridge that Intel started using and that it was decreasing uh, overclocking capability and increasing heat levels because they went with the cheap route with the thermal interface. Well, they didn't right. fix it with Haswell, but they're fixing it with Devil's Canyon, which is the code name for a couple of these new parts. And they're using a quote, um, what do they call it? A next generation polymer thermal interface material. Um, right. And they've also done things like they've added capacitors to smooth out some power delivery uh, to the processor. The, the net mm -hmm. result of this is really interesting. They've created two new SKUs, the Core i7-4790K and the Core i5-4690K. Now, the 4790K is by far the more interesting part. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes the 4770K, which is the current highest-end Haswell kind of enthusiast level part, and takes the base clock from 3.5 all the way up to 4 gigahertz and the boost frequency from 3.9 to 4.4. So you're getting a 500 megahertz increase in clock speed at all levels, right? At the base clock and at the max turbo clock. And <clears throat> I think it's only going up by like 8 watts on the TDP. Even mm. better, if you look at the pricing on the side of that, both the 4770K and the 4790K are $339 estimated pricing, right? So... Mm. It's kind of crazy to me that they would this is this is either like a super goodwill gesture on Intel's part or right. uh, the 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 part is going to be so limited that pricing won't be at that level anyway, right? We just I just we just okay. don't know yet. Uh, as of today, actually if you go to Amazon or Newegg, uh, they have pre-orders available. You can actually okay. in, in classic Micro Center fashion, this processor <laughs> is for sale for $280. Whoa. Pre-order on their store, right? So 60 bucks under MSRP. I don't know how they do it, but they do it all the time. The secondary part, the Core i5-4690 is much less interesting. You're only getting like 100 megahertz on each. Uh, but the idea, again, would be that you'll have additional overclocking headroom thanks to the ad added capacitors and the new uh, thermal interface material. Uh, our part is arriving tomorrow, so we'll be starting doing some of that testing and playing around uh, then. Mm -hmm. And then I expect availability for these actual parts to be before the end of the month as well. Oh, wow. But, I mean, it's... I got to say, I, I expected sort of a much higher price given the sort I, of, you know, yep. hyperbole in the, in the description. Uh, I agree. I was thinking this... I, I just, I don't, I don't know why <laughs> they wouldn't, I don't know why they wouldn't do it. It seems like if mm -hmm. they had said, hey, this is three ninety nine, it's not very much more, but it's... That it would, right. I still would have been, this is definitely worth $60 more if you're going to buy, you know, uh, I would consider this a high-end processor right. in today's market. Um, but if it's not and you can buy it at that price, right. like clearly if you're looking at these two processors, if you're, right. there's no reason why you would not get the 500 megahertz faster part. It's not even at a much right. higher TDP. So we'll test out temperatures, you know, here uh, tomorrow. Right. But I don't imagine the temperatures will be much different. Like you're not going to have to have a much different cooling solution or anything like that mm -hmm. if you're just using it at base speeds. But 500 megahertz is a significant kind of free upgrade uh, on a processor. I, so good on them. Yeah, I mean, it's also it's it's like looking at the 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 Pentium announcements. I like because I've I've been playing around with the idea of building, seeing you know, building like a $400 gaming machine 
you know, scrounging as many parts as possible, you know, recycling what you can and just keeping it down to like sort of motherboard, CPU, GPU, memory, you know, a decent power supply. And those, those Intel Pentiums, right? Because I, I just, the recycling of the Atom names and the Pentium names, I understand why Intel is doing it at some level, but on another level, you know, these aren't bad parts, uh, especially for today's games, you know, or the majority oh, no. of today's games or last year's games or fundamentally single-threaded applications. Um, you know, three megabytes of cache, uh, you know, DDR1333, which is going to be fine. You know, DDR3, 1600, I mean, the, the memory speed is going to be fine, but you're looking at like 3.4 gigahertz or a 3.2 gigahertz overclockable part for like $72. Um, interesting. Yep. Um, you know, and socket 1150, so you've got an upgrade path for it. So I'm excited. Not as excited, though, as I am to see in real life what the Philips virtually seamless dual display IPS monitor looks like. Uh, what did Sebastian have to say about this? It's like a giant wing arrow thing. <laughs> yeah, the idea is uh, that it is a multi-monitor configuration with a very small bezel between them. I think they say uh, as little as 3.5 millimeters, right? right? Which is oh, interesting. These are 19-inch displays. Yes. So it's two 19-inch huh. displays in kind of an interesting fashion. They, they can rotate, I think, 20 degrees is what it is either way. So okay. you can set an outward-facing angle if you're maybe doing, you know, sharing with somebody at the desk. Or you can do inward-facing if it's just a single person. Um it looks kind of like a gimmick to me, though. It looks like something like it won the Computex Innovation and Design Award or something like that. And it and all we see is renderings. This looks like a product that may never come out. Uh, <laughs> right? It has it has the the taste and the smell of that to me. Uh, but it, okay, you know the the idea of monitors with these extremely thin bezels, and in this case, a flexible one, like that has kind right. of like this ability to Hinge. rotate in the middle and still remain, you know, in contact and touch is really cool. Um, and, you know, it's validating some of what people have done in terms of disassembling their monitors to try to minimize the bezel for Ifinity and NVIDIA surround solutions, you know, for a while now. I don't recommend doing that, by the way, but some people are. <laughs> uh, and this is, you know, if they expanded this out to three panels, three 19-inch panels, or maybe three 22-inch panels, if if the technology right. works and if the, the form factor is you know repeatable in other designs, uh, it could be interesting. That, but you know, no pricing, no availability, no actual no product shown. Yeah, no resolution, right? Like they didn't. It's 19 inch panels. They didn't even list the resolution of it. They look like four by three panels as well. Um, but it's hard yeah. to tell from the from the the pictures that they made for it. So I don't know about that. Um, what's going on with Western Digital and the SATA Express Base PCI Express hard disk drives? Are those affordable or are those going to be insanely expensive? Uh, I think this was just kind of like a tech demo. I don't even know if it's something okay. that's going to be out. They basically married a four terabyte hard drive to a huh. 120 gig SSD and cool. put it <laughs> I see on what the you mean SATA by Express tech. interface. The picture, I think, Burke, you need to pull up the picture on that one because it does have that sort of like. Oh, oh next no. story. Sorry about that. There it is. <laughs> First PCI Express hard drive SATA Express interface um, allows cabled connection at PCI Express speeds. Yeah, that does have the kind of tech demo kind of feel to it. I mean, um, it's, th this, is, this is the direction that hard drive vendors are, are going to have to go in. Like Seagate just recently bought, this week actually, um, the flash division of LSI, mm -hmm. previously known as Sandforce. Um, so Seagate is going to go down that road heavily. I don't, we're, we're still kind of seeing what Western Digital is going to do. They've done some hybrid solutions as well. And this is essentially a hybrid hard drive with a PCI Express interface. But um, even Alan last night on the show was kind of questioning the, the usefulness of having a PCI Express interface that can run at like two gigabytes a second if you only have at most 100 gigs of, status, of SSD storage, right, where you could literally get right. through it all in 30 seconds. Right, even if you were reading or writing all of it. So uh, interesting to see SAT Express devices, but this may not be the the one that you really want to own quite yet. Sad. Um, Samsung 845DC Evo Enterprise TLC SSDs. Are those 
consumer products or enterprise products? No, they're enterprise products. And okay. I, I don't really know much on them yet, but uh, okay. Alan is, we are, there are currently benchmarks running on them across the room from me. So uh, we'll know <laughs> soon whether or not they're useful. <laughs> What we know right now is Alan's opinion on the Thecus. And by the way, I would like to point out at this moment that our 2014 CompuTest coverage is officially over, uh, barring whatever reviews we do of the, the products involved or, or PC Pro does of the products involved at this point. We're actually now moving on to a storage device reviewed by someone who is not Alan Malventano. Sebastian wrote this up for PC Pro. The Thecus N2310 Soho NAS server, quote, budget storage with premium features. So I'm assuming, yep, this is a dual drive uh, NAS. Uh, did did Sebastian run this in mirror mode or, you know, crazy lose my data striped mode? <laughs> you know, I don't know. I get, I would, you've got to use it in mirror mode, right? Because yeah. the, it, it's a, it does have USB 3. So there, there could potentially be performance benefits from running that in RAID 0. Uh, but if you're using it over a network, which I think most people would, uh, you know, you're limited by gigabit Ethernet, right. which is like 110 to 120 megabytes per second at most, which is sustainable by a single hard drive. So RAID 1 is really where you want to go. And even when you're doing RAID 1, mm -hmm. you know, you are, uh, you're actually able to read fast mm -hmm. as well, right? Because you actually have two right. sources with which to read from. So uh, right. it's an interesting little device. It's, uh, he, you know, it, it's it's definitely a budget device. Uh, the performance was pretty good. He was getting close to those gigabit speeds uh, okay. for reading and like 70-something megabytes for writing. And, you know, the downside to it is really the software. The software has all the features you would expect out of a, of a network storage device, but it's just not pretty. It's not user-friendly. Uh, it has, you know, like varying color schemes, varying interface styles as right. you switch between sections of the software. Um, it has interesting features, like it has an app center, but the apps in it are fairly mediocre, I think is right. overstating it maybe. Um, and then, you know, the software kind of it looks like basically this is not easy enough that I would give it to my mom or my sister or somebody and say, hey, just use this and back up your computers at home, right? It, it requires a little bit more uh, information and insight to it, right? If you look at like the last page and that shows the thickest backup utility and it's just a mess of text and empty fields and add, remove, back, modify, run buttons and, um, you know, some wizards and some easier stuff might help. Some cleanup of the software could be uh, advantageous as well. But, uh, you know, for the price and uh, for people who maybe listen to this podcast who have, a, you know, a pretty good sense of, of what they need and what they're looking for, I think uh, it would make a good option if you don't have any kind of uh, yeah. backup solution as it is now. It's $149 without the hard drives. So I, I will say it is not a complete backup solution. And in deference to a lot of angry posts uh, in, in, the, in, in the comments down below where people are like cringing because it's not a full this or a full that or, you know, a free NAS set up on an ECC correcting uh, memory equipped motherboard. Um, you know, some, you know, it, three, two, one, three copies, you know, <laughs> three copies. You know, it, it's, it, it's, it, sorry, um, you know, one copy offsite, two different devices. You know, it's, it's funny. It's like suddenly after five years of spouting it, the three, two, one sort of backup rules is, is out of my head, but it's, <laughs> you know I mean? This, this is part of a backup solution. This is a good way to share media inside of your house. Yeah. This is a good way to start. I mean, you know, the idea, what's interesting with, with some of these, cause I've been watching people have been freaking out. Like I need the ultimate protection of data because sunspots will destroy the memory in my drives. Take a deep breath. I get it. You want to make sure you have the ultimate data protection, but the ultimate data protection is making sure there's a third copy that's not in the building with your stuff to make sure you have a second copy um, and to update it regularly, right? And to check it regularly, you know, for somebody who doesn't have all the money for, you know, a nine bay $4,000 system, you know, for 200 bucks, this is a lot better than just being like, well, I got a thumb drive and I got my laptop. So I got that, right? So, you know, now they can have, you know, a thumb drive and my laptop Amethicus or whatever their chosen device is. You know, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, you know, I'm just saying it's, it's been funny. We did a free NAS build on Die Tryon, 
and I got lit up by one guy and, uh, uh, you know, I, I grokked where he was going, you know? Um, but on the other hand, you know, I get it. You know, this is not the ultimate bomb proof enterprise grade, full on fail safe, fail over, you know, freaking coolest backup system on the planet. Um, but it is going to do something like make sure that your data is in a second location other than your PC or your laptop, um, yep. and, you know, or, and it, or not a second location, but a second drive. And, and that's important. Um, sorry, I'm going to climb down off my soapbox now and go kick a can down the street. But I just, yeah. I get that people are like, they, they don't, they don't like mirroring. They want more sophisticated, you know, backup tools or more sophisticated technology, but sometimes you just want to get people something that they can use and set up and understand and do basic administration on. Um, <laughs> In any case, one last story, I think, before we go. Uh, Intel SSD PC P3700 800 gigabyte review. Quote, ludicrous speed for the masses. Do I even want to know what the cost is on, on the product that is in Alan's latest review? I'm, I'm afraid, man. I'm just um, I'm scrolling and I'm looking at this giant. It's better than car. you're going to expect. It's better than you're, oh. gonna, than you're expecting, right? So Hey there. Um, I just found here's, the price. here's what's interesting. Here's what's interesting <laughs> okay. with this device. It is a it, this is a data center product, and it has three it. segments: the P3700, the 3600, and the 3500. And as you go down that stack, price per gigabyte goes down because it has, uh, I think, where's the where's the the metric here? The highest end is rated to have um, ten device writes per day. So you could write the entire device 10 times wow. per day for five years and still be under <laughs> warranty, right? That is um, 36.5, <laughs> that, petabytes of writing. What we like to call a lot to use a, a standard industry technology yeah. term. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, these are PCI Express SSDs from Intel. They are uh, unique uh, almost there, there's several other in the industry, but most PCI Express SSDs that you see are a RAID controller. And then behind that RAID controller are several SATA based SSD controllers. So this is actually a native PCI Express SSD controller. It's also the first we have seen with NVMe, um, which stands for all of a sudden my mind is blanking. Uh, <laughs> uh, NVMe Express, non-volatile memory extensions or non-volatile memory yes. express. And what it is, is it's actually a new interface to communicate with storage. It basically connects directly to the processor. It doesn't go through SATA, it doesn't go through AHCI, it doesn't go through SAS, it doesn't have any of these other legacy things kind of getting in the way of bottlenecking latency or IO operations and stuff like that. Um, so it's like stupid fast. Uh, 2.8 gigabytes per second we tested reads and like 1.9 wow. gigabytes per second writes, 400 and something thousand operations per second, IOs per second on IAMETER, like blowing everything else out of the water. It's, it's, it's way up there, right? Available at 400, 800, 1.6, 1.2, and two terabyte models, I think. Uh, you know, long story short, it's the fastest thing you're going to be able to buy. Right. Now, it is expensive. The 400 gig model it's of the highest end for is consumers. Uh, let me point this out because, like, if you're a consumer, twelve hundred dollars is ridiculous. If you are, you know, a a business that if they can pick up a half a second every two days in trading with Wall Street, this is ridiculously cheap. Um, yes, this is and, you know and even uh, it, it, the the lower end, the DC uh, P35, which is its lowest end, actually gets down to a dollar fifty a gig. Right, wow. so the 400 gig model is 5.99, and we were talking about this last night on the podcast. And that's a dollar fifty a gig is not very long ago where all SSDs were at, right? Even you right. know just SATA SSDs, and it's it's very likely that some high end enthusiasts, some some people that are spending six six seven hundred eight hundred dollar cards on video cards, um, would find this beneficial, or they would find this in their system. You know, it, it's interesting. Like the NVMe is interesting because like when you plug it in your system, it shows up in the BIOS as a device. Like it shows hmm. up as storage. When you are installing right. uh, Windows 8.1 or later, it just shows up as a device that you can install to, right? You don't need a driver. You don't need anything like that. And when you get in Windows, you install a driver and it improves performance. But if you're just installing an OS, you can do it right away. Um, 
So there's really interesting things to it. What I'm hoping Intel will do with this is they will take this controller and mm -hmm. they will make like an extreme edition variant of it that is a little bit less expensive, maybe using a flash that's, that's, uh, you know, guaranteed a little bit lower rate in order to get it down closer to that dollar per gig range. Because I think enthusiasts would eat this up at that performance levels. Because even if it's just for bragging rights, if you're going from being bottlenecked by the SATA 3 interface at about mm -hmm. 550 megabytes per second uh, to going up to almost three gigabytes per second, that's hmm. impressive. And that's a buy that's for crazy. PCI 3.0 connection. It's it's our new favorite thing in the office right now. Uh, and we actually have a second of them and we're kind of, we're going to, we, it took so much, it, it takes so much uh, CPU resources to kind of bog down the device because it's so fast. It was taking almost 60% of a quad core overclocked Ivy Bridge part. Uh, it's taking over 56, almost 60% of the CPU utilization to like saturate. It was just, data right and that's never it's never been a thing we've had to deal with before um mm. it's definitely worth checking out the review now before before we get to the end there's one other product that one we have to mention it because it is the polar opposite of this but equally exciting <laughs> the crucial mx100 review that also went up this week that alan posted oh. um this is a standard two and a half inch a sata drive Yep, it's using 16 nanometer flash, so it's it's cost reduction. Uh, its performance is actually pretty good. It's not top of the line SATA SSD, but it's pretty good. And okay. we already found, it just came out this week, we already found the 512 gig model on uh, Newegg selling for $199 L for a 512 gig SSD. $199. That's like 50 cents, cents a gigabyte. Per gig. It's, it was 38 less than, cents per gig. That's nuts, yep. dude. And the performance, extremely competitive cost per gigabyte, solid performance on the 512 gigabyte drive. Um, 128 gigabyte drive, cost per gigabyte, not so great. Quote, significant write speed reductions on capacities below 512 gigabytes. So basically, if you want to buy this drive, buy the big one, buy the 512 uh, gigabyte drive. That is crazy. Um that is crazy for the 512 gigabyte drive. Like even the, the standard price is like 225 bucks, comes with a three-year warranty. Um, gold award from PC per and well-deserved. Um, skip the 128 gigabyte version. Wow, man, that's epic. That's so it, it's, it's interesting that these, these two stories came out within two days of each other, right? <laughs> you've, got, you've got this new watermark for performance. And right. a performance, you could get it for like $1.5 per gig. Uh, and then you've got this even better watermark, I think, for performance per dollar per gigabyte, right? Which is not really a metric that exists, but one I just made up where it's pretty good performance and 38 cents per gig. Like that's that's when you, if you could find it for $1.99, that's, that's the rating. I think it was like 44 cents per gig or something like that at its, at its actual price of $2.25. It's MSRP. But... It's that's that's amazing. Like it's, I I, I don't need yeah. any more SSDs now that Alan is living here and he keeps all the SSDs. And like anytime I want an SSD, I can just go to the shelf and take one. Even I was like at hundred nine had hundred ninety nine dollars. Had my like finger hovering over the new egg button. You know, I was like, <laughs> this, I don't need this. Oh, I'll just wait. I'll just wait. Hundred ninety nine dollars. That's a that's a big night at a bar. I mean, that's that's not SSD money. That's affordable. Um, yep. Says the guy with children. Um, <laughs> no, that's a fantastic price for a drive that big. The performance isn't bad. Um, that's awesome. I, I say we just stop. We end it on a high note. We tell everybody it's finally time to go buy the SSD that they've been wanting. At least they've been wanting an affordable 512 gigabyte SSD. And we re remind everybody that normally we answer questions on this show. But given the incredible, never-ending flood of Computex stories, uh, we deleted the questions from this episode. But should you desire to send us a question in the future, at Ryan Shroud, at Patrick Norton on the Twitters, uh, or you can email Twitch, T-W-I-C-H. Let me say that one more time slowly to compensate for the braces. That's Twitch, T-W-I-C-H, at twit.tv. And uh, as always, we want to thank the chill people in the chat room for joining in. And I want to make a quick mention of... Uh, 
Well, I'm just going to say it, people. Bacon. Because, <laughs> you know, bacon. Oh, my goodness. Wow, dude. I, you know what? One last thing before we go. Should we even mention Google's Project Tango? The uh, uh, we, K1 tablets I don't, that are I don't know old. what it is other than a really cool tablet that I want to buy. But it's a developer <laughs> device, right? Like... It's a developer kit, cost $1,000, which is really funny for a tablet to cost that much these days. It's $1,024. Um, Get it? I, Get I, it? I, I, <laughs> I'm just, uh, yeah, the, the technology is the unique part. Project Tango is aimed at developers to make apps which understand the 3D world around the tablets. Uh, robotics, computer vision, alternate reality games, mapping, um, um, Cribbin from Scott Michaud who wrote this up. Um, introduced the obligatory uh, reference uh, to Skynet being uh, originating at Google. Um, yeah, this is pretty trippy. Um, developers ships later this month, $1,024. I'd be really curious to see what this turns into. Um, and more importantly, to see what this is uh, a year from now. Um, this Agreed. is pretty crazy. Yeah. Spatially aware tablets to implement into other devices. Man. Huh. Robots, dog. It's made for robots. We are seeking professional developers hoping to create more than a touchscreen app. Project Tango provides unique sensing capabilities that allow developers to explore new user experiences not possible on other mobile devices. So this is the tablet to go with your Oculus Rift while you're wandering around in meat space. I, I signed up. Hopefully thing. they'll pick me, but I just want to play with it as a tablet. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have any aspirations to create uh, really cool applications that can take advantage of three-dimensional space, but uh, I would like to use other people's applications that they create to take advantage of three-dimensional space. So All I'm going to say is I have, I have this vision of you being picked, getting the tablet, <laughs> donning your white developer's robes, forsaking hardware reviews, and developing the perfect 3D application. So be careful. Okay, this fair this tablet could change your life permanently. Um, or it'll just be one of those strange things that pops up really expensively on eBay for a couple of months and then people forget about it. TWICH at twit.tv is the email address. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Schrout. Thank you so much for watching this week in computer hardware. We'll see you next week.